Thank you so much to the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County for being with us here tonight to talk about winter rose care and pruning. Um, please be sure to check out the, the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County's website for a calendar of all of their events and um, ways that you can ask questions there and uh, yeah, get in touch with them. Tonight, we're joined by Master Gardener Pamela Roper and moderating in the chat will be Master Gardener Pamela Traunstein. And with that, I will hand it over. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm gonna get started. I'll launch my um, presentation right now. Uh, so let me get that going. Okay. Hello, hope you're enjoying this nice uh, warm day we had today. My name's Pamela Roper and I'm with the University of California Master Gardener Program. I want you to take a look at these three uh, roses that are on the front page because I'm gonna show you what they look like um, as of uh, two days ago when I pruned them at the very end. Okay, so um, as Daniel mentioned, um, you sh should be in speaker view, your video uh, is, should be off, your microphone is automatically muted, and Pamela will be looking at questions into the chat. So if you take a look at the chat, uh, and if you take some time to type in your questions into the chat, Pamela will be looking at them. I don't intend to go uh, over questions as we talk about each of the learning objectives, because I'm hoping that I'll answer most of your questions, but we will leave plenty of time at the end for questions, um, unless Pamela starts to see a lot that are uh, similar um, and that it seems like we need to answer them, then she'll let me know and we'll um, go from there. Okay, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Master Gardener Program of um, Santa Clara County. Um, we are um, a group of uh, master of uh, trained volunteers that uh, go through a program where we um, get certified as master gardeners and every year we have to keep that up. Um, we, the University of California Cooperative Extension um, is the um, group that administers the county um, university uh, agriculture naturalization program. And um, we are an international organization and also national um, but not all the states in the U.S. Have, have programs, Master Gardener programs. In California, 52 counties actually do, and they're very much associated with the University of California that's closest to that particular county. Our help desk is listed on this so slide. As Daniel said, there's a host of information there. You can see what's going on in terms of free talks throughout the county. There are a lot of wonderful um, materials. Um, including um, a link that I see that I showed here with the um, help desk, which will, you can type a question into um, an email and that will get answered. Um, there are gardening tips and events that are, are shown. Like I said, um, we have right now, we have, um, they're not open because of COVID, but we have 10 locations that have 12 um, demonstration gardens from um, Morgan Hill all the way to Palo Alto. And once we're out of the condition we're in, um, they will open up again. And those are wonderful places to take your family and um, friends and yourselves to just uh, look at all kinds of information, um, all kinds of gardening examples. And we have events there as well when we're not in, in, in a pandemic. Um, so as I said, take a look at some time. There's really good information about um, planting charts, what to do when, when to plant what, and, and what grows in Santa Clara County. And a lot of that's been trialed and tested. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, move into our next slide. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, what we're gonna talk, cover today are learning objectives. I'm gonna talk to you about pruning, uh, why we prune, when we prune, the equipment and tools that should be used, and a little bit about how to prune. I actually pruned my roses. Um, I have quite a few um, over the last, uh, took me two days, but um, I'll show you a little bit of, about what they look like at the end. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. This is the perfect time to be doing pruning. Um, we're gonna talk about how you can propagate and get roses from your existing roses. I'm gonna touch a little bit about disease and pest prevention. Not a lot, but I hopefully will get into enough to let you know what really, what critters bother us in uh, Santa Clara County. I'll talk a little bit about fertilizing roses, how to feed the soil and reduce weeds and watering. So why do we prune roses? Well, in 
we want to shape and train them. We want to, um, it all depends on the various types of roses that you have. So the, the examples of the types of roses can be a rambler, a climbing rose, a tree rose, a shrub rose, a landscape rose, and a, a hedge rose. There are different sort of techniques and timing depending upon what type of rose you have. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, we wanna get larger flowers and we wanna have healthier um, canes uh, and plants. So we prune to, to make that happen. Lots of times you might have a pathway that's got a big rose on it. You wanna prune that away in the winter when you can and you wanna reduce wind breakage on your plants so that your plant stays healthy. And you can get new cuttings, um, new plants by propagating cuttings. So one of the things you'll see is that when I talk about pruning, I'm gonna talk about when the optimum time is, but throughout the year, when you get roses, it's called deadheading and you can cut those back. Um, and usually uh, you cut those back and I'll tell you about how to do that in a little bit. So pruning to just cut the roses as they bloom is called deadheading and you do that throughout the year. So when do you prune? Well, our climate in the Bay Area is a Mediterranean climate. And we do not, rare, rarely roses in this area go completely dormant. So what we do see in the winter is that roses get into what, a resting state so that they um, don't have many leaves. Um, but the optimum time to prune is in my opinion and everything else that I've read is between January 1st and February 15th. And you wanna, if you have a big, um, rose collection, you might want to start in December, um, but it's a good time to prune uh, before you think there's going to be any kind of freeze or uh, temperatures that get really low where you have uh, frost and freezing. A lot of um, gardeners debate on when you prune roses, but if you have a once bloomer, like it's a climbing rose and it blooms once, then you prune that right after it blooms. And we'll talk a little bit about more climber roses in the next slide or so. Um, you want to really prune before you see any little buds come out. And I'll talk to you about what those bud unions look like and, and how you can detect those. And there are a lot of places, and I put it in the handout, and there's some videos that I put into your handout that show actual pruning techniques and uh, YouTube videos about how to prune, depending upon the type of rose. And there, there are three of them, and they're all very good. Um, and then there are local rose groups like the San Jose Heritage Rose Garden that I don't know what they're doing now with COVID, but typically they have um, volunteer sessions where you can go out and actually help uh, and prune. Um, and those are usually in January. So I don't think they're having them now, but in the future, um, they probably will. So when I first started uh, pruning roses, I thought, okay, you know, I don't need all that fancy stuff. Um, I'm just gonna go out and start pruning. Well, the first thing I did was realized, oh, geez, my um, arm's bleeding and I haven't, and my little short gloves didn't work very well. I like to wear a long sleeve shirt and I think everybody should wear a long sleeve shirt and long pants and then um, rubber or leather gloves for thorn protection. I'm showing gauntlet gloves in this uh, particular uh, slide. They work really well. I actually got a new pair of this year and I had them out this week and they worked great. So you wanna protect yourself. So you also wanna use um, sharp um, uh, bypass uh, pruners. Um, don't use an anvil type. It's gonna, a bypass pruner uh, is what you wanna do. An anvil type pruner is going to not do a clean cut and it's gonna squash the, uh, and, and uh, press down on the, on the rose cane that you're cutting. I pull out a saw, I pull out some loppers, and I grab a trash can and I have it in the area. And I actually spread a sheet or old um, um, bed cloth down underneath. Uh, makes it a lot easier just to pick it up and dump it into my green bin to dispose of it. Um, you wanna make sure that your tools are clean and sharpened. Um, a sharp tool is a, is a good tool. Um, you can clean those with like scrubbing bubbles or you can use Lysol and you wanna oil your tools after you um, clean and sharpen them. Um, I avoid Clorox even though it's a great um, disinfectant sanitizer, it tends to cause rust so I don't use it too often. Um, and I can't stress using eye um, protection enough, um, especially when you're bending down and looking at, uh, at the rose that you're pruning. Oh, I wanted to also talk about a couple other things. 
You can use automatic hedge trimmers if you have a huge uh, rambling climbing rose, um, just to get it down to where you can start to think about how you want to remove some of the canes, but you can hedge trim that and get it down and then start using your other tools to do the fine tuning. One of the things I want to say about um, the equipment you have is, is just, you don't need all of this stuff, but when you get down to where you have bigger roses and canes that you have to remove, it really helps to have the loppers and the, and the saw. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about rose anatomy. This will help. Um, when you do deadheading, that's the first um, slide that you're going, the first diagram you're gonna see on the left there. Um, it talks about getting down to uh, five leaflet leaves. So when you get a flower and it's summertime and you want to remove it, count down to you see two leaves come across that have five uh, of them uh, together. So you count one, two, three, four, five. They can be fives or seven. You want to cut right above that five leaf um, count because what it does is it it adds it keeps vigor in the plant and allows the plant to grow off that old wood the next year. So that's called deadheading and um, count down to five and it will really help. In the next, the center um, diagram, you're gonna see um, what I'm trying to um, pull out is called the outward facing bud. So every time you see um, a stem come out or a flower come out, it usually is right above that bud. So you can start to look at these at the outside of your plant, you always want to look on the outside, not the inside of these canes or branches. Look on the outside and look for that outward facing bud. When you find that, you want to make your cut about a quarter inch above that. Um, and that, do that at a 45 degree angle, um, not at a sharp angle because you'll create um, area that you don't need for um, any kind of disease or, uh, or, or critter to get in there. And then the last one is just showing you that there's typically a bud union at the bottom of your um, flower bush, your rose bush, and you might even see suckers come up. Always get rid of those suckers. Um, they're coming off the root, um, the root stem. I mean, excuse me. The um, uh, they're coming off off of the the. Uh, oh, I'm having a mental block. They're coming off of the back, the roots po portion of of the actual rose, and you want to trim those off. But this is just a little bit of background on what you see when you look at a rose. So what, as I said, you want to make a cut. You want to look for that outward facing bud. You're going to cut it at a 45 degree angle. It doesn't have to be exactly 45. I've, I've, there's pros and cons on both. You can go straight across, but a 45 degree angle seems to be about right. Um, and you want to cut a, about a quarter inch above that dormant bud uh, eye. Uh, and cut on the outside. Because if you cut on the outside, you're gonna force the plant to grow on the outside. So it starts to angle outward, not inward. That's why they say, look for the outward facing bud, um, and bud eyes and cut there. The other two diagrams show you what a, a rose bush might look like in, in the dormancy stage or in, in winter. And you wanna say to yourself, I'm gonna get down to the diagram on the right. It's kind of open, it's got a, a base shape going with it. Um, and you're gonna go in and you're gonna say, what do I see that looks dead? And get rid of those right away. Cut them down, if they're dead, cut them all the way down to the, the bud union that we talked about at the bottom. If they're um, shriveled up, you'll see that. If they're the size of a pencil, you wanna cut them out too. But you can bring your plant down, and I'm gonna show you that, to about a third to a half. If you start getting into a lot um, lower, then you're going to be doing like if you take off two thirds to, you know, um, more than a half, you're going to, that's deep pruning and you weaken your plant when you do that. So you probably don't want to do that. You probably should start with about a third. There's nothing magical about it. You, the rose is going to survive unless you really cut it too, too low. And um, so I wouldn't worry about that so much. So before you get started, you want to think about what kind of rose do I actually have? If I have a climbing rose, um, that's typically um, the type that does either once a year bloom or twice a, a year bloom. If it's a once a year bloom, you want to prune it back right after it blooms. 
if it's a twi ever blooming or, or repeat blooming, you're gonna do it in winter. So decide how far down you wanna go and, and take off the growth there. I always, as a rule of thumb, say about one third. Then I'm gonna take out everything that's a twiggy growth, like the size of a pencil in diameter. I'm gonna look for that outward facing bud. I'm gonna take that, I can take it all the way down or I'll take it to where it's at a bigger cane. So take those out. Look for crossing canes, look for um, disease canes, take those out. Um, don't leave little stubs. If, if they're diseased, get them all the way down at the bottom. Take them all the way down. And then look for those suckers that I showed you in that in that um, that bud union photo, and take all those off. You can, sometimes you can just break them off, but um, I tend to cut them off. And you need to you might need to dig down a little to see them, and then take them out because they take energy out of the plant, and they're not going to have any um, blooms on them. This particular slide is really busy, so I'll try to explain it uh, without you having to read all of the. Um, the, how detailed it is. There are several different types of roses that all get pruned the same way. And I um, put hybrid teas, floribundas, and grand, grand, oops, grandifloras into one category. Those are um, roses that produce large single flowers. Um, and actually grandifloras can do clusters of flowers, but usually these are the type you buy at the florist that have a, like a long stem and then there's a rose at the end. In the case of grandifloras, they have clusters of flowers. So those can grow from two to four feet tall. And it's the same rule of thumb. Take them back about a third to a half from the last year's growth. So you'll see, you'll start to start to see what that growth looks like. Cause you'll say, oh, there was where I cut that, deadheaded that flower. And now there's another thing that grew off of that. So prune them to about um, an average of about 14 to 18 inches, mostly depends on how tall they are. If they're taller than, um, then um, like grandifloras can get pretty tall. So um, I would never take those down any lower than two feet. So, and then look at that base shape we talked about. You wanna keep that base shape open because you wanna have air circulation through there. You wanna keep the plant um, having the ability to get, you know, circulation through the canes. So leave about five to 10 canes. For shrubs and older roses, they have a lot of twiggy growth and they are desirable because they can prune on a flower on old wood, which, which means that you didn't cut that back and it's still able to produce a flower. So you can just use the same rule of thumb that you do with the other ones, um, but they're going to always be a little bit twiggier. So, you know, keep, again, keep an open base shape and keep them open. Ramblers, they like to climb and get huge, um, but they're not going to bloom um, until about two to three years after you plant them. So I don't, um, I don't trim them back either for a while. I let them grow for a couple of years. Those are, those are the type of flowers that have clusters and they're about two inches across. And they can have canes that are 10 to 15 feet long in one season. So it's best to kind of look at, um, you can leave some of the old wood. What, what I mean by that is leave the old canes in place um, and they'll bloom from last year's growth. And typically um, ramblers um, flower once. So you want to trim the, prune those right afterward. So you're gonna, re again, remove the old large damaged canes, leave support canes in place, so that they hold up the, the plant and um, don't worry too much about them because they'll, they'll come back and be vigorous every year. I have a lot of climbing roses in my yard and they have, um, they, there are once bloomers again and, and repeat bloomers. So if you have a once bloomer, I typically prune in June. Um, for the repeat bloomers, I prune back in um, now, January. Um, for the same type of thing, cut out all the dead and diseased canes, root, remove one or two of the oldest canes to make room for new canes. And you'll look, you'll look and you'll see those old canes. You'll know because they're gonna be bigger, older, and they're gonna look darker and dried out. And then what you see with climbing roses is they have, they have the longer canes, the main ones that, that you might train on a trellis or a fence or some support. 
And then they have lateral. So if you're to hold a pencil and, and think about little things shooting out of the top or shooting out of the, back, the bottom, those are the lateral canes. And you wanna trim those back to three or four inches. One of the things with um, climbing roses is you wanna have the train of the, of the laterals pointing down so that they're draping, not up because they grow up and they look, they don't have that shape that you want. So you want to make sure that you get some of those um, climbing um, uh, laterals downward pointing um, towards the ground because they'll, they'll um, start to have the right shape and not be overwhelming at the top of your trellis or growing over it. Um, anyway, um, make sure after you do climbing roses and some that are rambling, it, support them to the trellis or the fence um, so that they're, so they're not gonna break off with the wind or any of the other problems. And then I have a few tree roses. There was one in the, the photo that I showed at the beginning, I'll show at the end. And you need to prune those back to their, to their um, grafted bushy head. And you can leave like, you know, four inches or so, five inches at the top of that. And I'll show you a picture at the end so you can see that. And those are just grafted uh, onto, and they're long like trees. So you'll see they're bushy at the top. They have like flowering antlers and they have bud unions that you'll see that were just like the ones at the bottom, but they're at the top of the trunk, not at the bottom. Okay, I'm rambling on here. After I prune out all the canes, disease canes, the pencil shaped cane, uh, size canes, I take off every single leaf and I either clip them off or pull them away because they harbor insects, rust and other diseases that can carry over from uh, over winter or carry over from one, one year to the next. You wanna clean all the leaves and debris away from the base of the plant. Sometimes you can see that the um, bud union in the area is scrape is um, uh, scaly at the bottom. You can scrape that off. Um, and you'll see that at the bud union, I did that the other day. I thought, oh, I haven't scraped that in a long time. Uh, but you wanna definitely get rid of all the debris and put it into your green waste, not into a compost, it's not going to it's not hot enough here and you certainly don't want any of those um, leaves, especially if they have rust and other uh, problems, fungal problems um, in your compost piles. Um, after pruning, I find it's a good time to spray with insecticidal soap or horticultural um, oil when they're dormant. And those soaps uh, that you use, uh, neem oil, different oils, they, um, they will destroy overwintering scales and insect eggs and other things that are um, harmful to the plant. You have to be careful though. You wanna to look to make sure that you don't see any beneficial insects. Those are things like um, lace wings, um, ladybugs, um, I can name a few others. Um, and don't do it when you think it's gonna rain because it's not gonna be effective. So don't do it when it's foggy or moisture. If there's moisture outside, look for a day like today and you could have sprayed. And then, like I said, dispose of all your old canes. Don't put them in the compost pile. I took these pictures um, this week. This, these are, instead of, uh, there are two types of roses that you can buy, bare root and potted roses. These are potted roses. Um, the one on the left, um, you can see this is January. This is, um, you can see the bud unions are starting to swell. See what I mean about outward bud unions and inward ones? Most of these were kind of out. So this is January and this isn't even planted and you're always seeing bud unions swelling. That's because it's been nice and warm and not as much rain. So this rose on the um, left is called um, Easy on the Eyes. It's, uh, it's a new one. It was produced in 2018. It's pretty fragrant. Um, when I say produced in 2018, it'll be really important when we start to talk about propagation because you can't propagate a rose. Um, you can, but it, has to depend, it depends on how, how long it's been around. On the right side is, is a bunch of uh, roses. Those are grandiflora roses. Those get quite tall. Um, these are um, five, they can get five to 10 feet tall actually. But take a look at how low these are when you buy them. So you see these are really pruned back and they're gonna grow like crazy, but you can kind of see the vase shape in the ones on the right and the left that they left. Um, and that's kind of what I wanted to pull uh, pull out of this. So you can see that they, these are pruned quite low, but they're still going to grow fine. Um, I don't know if you have any questions about planting roses, but we can kind of hit those at the end if, if uh, anybody has any interest.
So I talked about making new roses from cuttings and I talked about the age. So the uh, Grandiflora, the Queen Elizabeth that was in the previous one, which is the one on the right, all the, the group of those, that was introduced in 1955. So that rose you could propagate because um, it's, it's out of patent. The patent's 20 years on roses. So once the rose is older than 20 years, um, and you can look that up on Google, um, it's pretty easily defined. You can propagate it. The easy on the eyes one, that was the one on the left that had the little buds that were starting to come out, that's 2018. You could not, legally, you shouldn't um, make a, a, a rose from that or cut a cane to make a rose. So if you cut a cane, and we'll talk about how uh, big to cut them in next, it's gonna produce, when you put it, when you propagate it, exactly identical, it's gonna have the same blooms, it's gonna have the same um, look as the mother plant that you took it from. It's gonna take about two to three years to grow so that you can get some rose um, blooms from it and to get more than one cane. So what you do, and I put in the handout um, a really good um, link to um, a UC Davis um, source that shows you how to do propagation. But I did, did a couple this year. I thought, I'm gonna try this out on one of my older ones. I cut a stem to about six to eight inches. It's, I cut one about the size of a pencil. You can go a little bit bigger. Um, and I made a cut above the note, uh, that outward facing note at 45 degree angle. I didn't dip mine in rooting hormone, but you can uh, following the directions for rooting hormone. And then you just make a hole in the ground. So I took a pencil, stuck it down three inches, and I put that, that cane that I just cut into the ground, made sure it was snug and it wasn't gonna fall over. Um, and then I, um, I keep it damp, it's, you know, and, and water it. You can also do it in a pot. So in other words, you can take that cane, you can put it in the pot, um, you can even put it like a little mini greenhouse by taking a plastic bag, securing it with a rubber band um, and watching it and you start to see some growth. You're going to have to monitor that because you're going to have to water and have to make sure that it's not a sunny spot. Um, you can put a jar over it if it's not too tall. Once you have a six to eight inch um, cutting and you put it down three inches, you're going to either be at five or three inches. So you can put a jar over it and make a little greenhouse that way. But those are those you have to really monitor because you don't want them to get too sunny because you're going to burn it but it does create sort of a little greenhouse effect i've done it once i'm doing it again this year but i i've never put it uh, a little plastic bag or a um a jar over it i just monitor it look at it and believe it or not you know it starts to grow just by sticking it in the ground so that's how you can propagate look at that um link that i sent you in your handout because it's really handy um, I had to revisit it again just to see what was going on. And if I was doing it right, couldn't remember. All right, the next learning objective we're gonna talk about, and I'm going a little fast, I'm gonna look at my clock here, is disease and pest prevention. So I always think that the best prevention program you can have is to um, think about where I'm going to put that rose when I plant it. I'm gonna make sure that my soil seems to be prepared right. Do I have drainage? Am I spacing them per the manufacturer's recommendations or the rose information I have on that? There are disease resistant cultivars that are out there that are disease, uh, that are resistant to powdery mildew, resistant to spider mites, things like that. Buy those types of roses. If you buy a rose that the cultivar already looks like it has some kind of uh, stress and insect, some sort of fungal disease, don't buy it because it's going to continue to have it or you'll have to work hard to get rid of it. Um, the main diseases that we see in our area are powdery mildew, black spot, and rust. So look for roses that are resistant to that. Um, if you have those types of ailments or diseases that happen with your roses, um, there are things you can do. Um, black spot and rust, um, you have to look at the conditions that you're growing them in and um, keep, keep an eye on it because if you, if you have rust, you wanna make sure that you don't um, keep canes year to year or keep leaves year to year that have rust. So what I found, um, particularly with items like um, rust is that in California, if you're inland and it's wet, 
um, you're going to get more rust. So what you'll see is the infected leaves will drop off and you'll see little orange postules underneath. So what to do with that is to avoid overhead watering and prune back those canes heavily if you have that problem on your plant every year. And you, if you keep doing that, you'll get rid of it. If you have black spot, that's also a fungus. And you'll see that um, there are going to be um, kind of little margins or feathery things on, on, and black spot on the upper surface of the leaves. And then eventually you're going to see um, little black um, dots uh, or spots on your leaves. And really what happens with this is if your plant stays wet too long, you start to see this. You don't want your, your main part of your leaves wet for any more than seven hours. Um, if you're washing off plants, make sure you do it early in the day so you can avoid that. Um, and in most cases, master gardeners don't recommend any kind of um, harmful uh, fungicides or pesticides. Look for organic sprays for fungal diseases and follow the uh, recommended uh, instructions for those. On my roses, and I think roses in Santa Clara County, the number one pest is aphids. So look for them early in spring. And um, you can use horticulture oil on it, but there are a lot of benefic beneficial insects that will take care of your aphids for you. So before you do anything, look around and see, do I have any of those helpful insects? Do I have um, any um, ladybugs around, lacewings around, they're gonna take care of those for you. If it gets bad enough, you can use a, um, like neem oil or a spray like that. There are many ways to control the pests on roses. And um, I, in the handout, also gave you information in the resource sheet on pests and diseases for roses. There are a lot of pest guides that are out there. One of the things that I didn't say is, is um, you can get spider mites. And one of the things with spider mites is a lot of people are like, gosh, you know, I don't know why I get spider mites every year. Well, they have that rose in a very, very dusty area and they don't wash off the leaves and they don't look underneath the leaves and they don't treat underneath the leaves. So for spider mites, you wanna do that and you wanna constantly hose them off but you wanna do it earlier enough in the day so that they, the leaves have an opportunity to dry out because you're gonna introduce another um, disease or pest if you don't let that happen. So those are the main ones that we have here and um, someone's got their hand raised, but we, I guess we can get to that in a bit. Those are the main ones that we have here in Santa Clara County um, and that there's all, all different kinds of, of things like, um, and I'm gonna turn that next to this chart. There are a lot of, things that you can do by establishing a routine care for your roses. This is an example that came from Keynes County. Keynes, uh, Tulare Keynes County is about 176 miles away, away from here. It's got very similar, if not identical growing conditions for uh, roses as we have. Their dormancy rate is about the same as ours between New Year's and Valentine's Day. And what this particular chart says is you know, you've got to kind of look at your roses um, by month and kind of figure out what's going on. So for January and February, for example, you're going to prune them. You're going to plant your bare root or a container plant, like I showed you in that photo, uh, or transplant or propagate. Um, I always fertilize right after I, um, I do my pruning. And we'll talk about um, some of that in a second, about, uh, the type of fertilizer you can use and when to use it. Um, you don't need to fertilize as often as this chart shows you, but if you want large, big blooms throughout the year, they're saying fertilize throughout um, the summer. And a lot of people do, especially people that are growing roses for show or, or really like to have big flowers. Um, deadheading, like I said, is normal. You do it whenever you have a rose um, bud that's dead, does, uh, that's died back. You wanna go to the fifth leaf and cut right above that and do that throughout the summer. Um, we talked about aphids and beetles. There's a, several kind of beetles that, um, that uh, there's a, a fuller rose beetle, there's a notched and uh, that create notched and ragged edge, uh, edges of your leaves. There's hoopla beetles, just monitor for that and then look them up. If you see a beetle, you'll, don't get confused with big beetles. We don't have big beetles, but they're little small beetles and you'll see them. Um, aphids, same thing. Look for them in those months, particularly in the spring, early spring. Scale, that's another um, insect um, and uh, borers. Um, we talked about spider mats. 
mice, those are typically in the uh, dusty summertime areas, especially if you live like where there's dust or a road by you or something, you'll see a lot of spikes. Um, monitoring for uh, rust and uh, black spots is conditional. It's usually in the spring and you'll see that there. And then powdery mildew is also depends on the weather, but it's, it's these are the months when it mostly occurs. This is a pool table. I really liked it, kind of told you uh, what was going on. Um, fertilizing roses. Um, gosh, that's another whole thing to do when you do your pruning. I usually do it um, after bloom cycle if you want to encourage more flowering, but I do it, I do it when I prune. And I um, don't want to over fertilize. You don't want to add high nitrogen fertilizers. I don't know if you know that when you see something that says 10, 10, 10, that 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphate, and 10% um, potassium. So you'll see those labels on, on um, fertilizers. You want to stay in the 10, 10, 10 range. And it's kind of neat to have those um, uh, slow reduced, um, like, os like an osmocote that, uh, that um, actually uh, is where the, you put that fertilizer in and it actually um, goes over time where it, it, it uh, is, works its magic in the soil, letting it uh, feed itself throughout the uh, time that that's effective. Um, so I, I kind of figure out when do I want to do this? What's my annual fertility program going to be? Um, a spring application always is always good. Um, I talked about using a general purpose uh, fertilizer. I use about a half a cup to uh, one cup per plant as a good rule of thumb. I uh, spread it uh, in a band about six inches from the stem or the, the bud union, the growing um, area out to about 18 inches and I work it into the soil. I just get my trial and I work it into the soil. Um, if you wanna do like showed in the other chart, something in June, you can do that and you'll get bigger blooms or more blooms. And the encapsulated, um, like I said, the Alpsicote, those are controlled release. That was the word I was looking at. Those controlled release fertilizers, they work pretty well. Sometimes people who do water basin um, watering, in other words, they have a basin where they have water running through it, they might put, prefer a liquid fertilizer. Um, some gardeners spray their leaves directly with a hose end applicator with uh, fertil fertilizers. That works fine too. Again, do not let your um, rose leaves stay wet too long. You're gonna introduce uh, insects and diseases, fungal diseases. So you wanna do it early in the day and you wanna let them dry out. But the biggest thing you should do is be on the watch for beneficial insects. The worst thing you wanna do is kill a beneficial insect that's gonna take care of a spider mite or an aphid. And then you're gonna have more aphids because you killed the person that's the natural enemy. Uh, you killed the natural enemy of that particular insect. Um, let's see here feeding the soil and reducing weeds. So in Santa Clara County, we have very clay-like soil. I live in Saratoga. I know that I have clay soil throughout my yard. My roses do very well. They prefer well-drained soil, but because you have clay soil, you have to think about how often uh, you irrigate because you're going to tend to hold the, uh, the water in, in the soil longer. So it's fine to use a well-balanced compost. Um, I also um, like to use um, mulch around my roses, but I, again, have to keep that away from the um, stem. I don't want it to, to rot. So um, you can use three to five inches of organic materials like mulch. I tend to like the type that you can get from an arborist. Um, or an, uh, from a non-diseased um, ar tree from an arborist. Um, again, keep it six inches away from the trunk. You can also use woven landscape fabric and you can put it under um, your mulch and it will help control the weeds for, for several years. What you wanna do is, is like with any plant is get the weeds in early um, spring so that they don't produce flowers and produce more weeds. So it's a good idea to, to, to feed your soil and to reduce weeds by using mulch and compost. Okay, this is an interesting one because everybody has different ways that they water. Um, I tend to love um, drip line irrigation because it puts the water where you want it. 
Um, but you wanna figure out how much water your roses need. So all that's depending upon the type of soil you have. Do you have sandy loam soil, which means it's very, um, not, it doesn't clump into your hand. It's, it, roses really prefer that. But if you have clay-like soil, you know you need to water probably less because you're gonna retain water in the soil longer. So you also wanna look at the weather and, and you wanna um, irrigate a lot more when it's hot. Um, all roses like a lot of water or regular watering. Um, during the growing season, spring, you need to irrigate them deeply and in the summer um, if you want them to re uh, bloom repeatedly. Um, roses that only bloom once a season um, don't need a great deal of water, especially once they're established. Um, and all roses, once they're established, are a lot um, more um, drought tolerant, but they do like their water. I was listening to a talk the other day and they were talking about growing roses in the Central Valley or in, in desert areas, and they only are irrigating once a, a week, once every eight days or so. So as long as you get enough water so that you see that it's keeping the plant healthy, um, that's a great thing to do. Drip irrigation um, enables you to water where you want the water to go. It avoids getting the foliage, foliage wet. I've talked about wet leaves and the problems that they um, present in terms of fungal diseases and, and, and certain types of insects. Um, you can do overhead water, especially overhead watering, especially if you want to wash away aphids and uh, spider mites, as well as spores and some mildew. But again, do it earlier in the day. And then you want to mulch around your roses, as I said in the last slide, because it'll keep the roots cooler and the plant will need a lot less water. Um, if you have water or drought stress roses, you'll see the canes start to sunburn. You'll definitely get spider mites and your leaves will start to, you'll, they'll fall off. You'll have defoliation. Um, I think that uh, uh, irrigation in a landscape um, twice a week is all you need and not for very long, for about, I, I think I water like 15 minutes or so. Um, and then if you have poorly drained soils, again, watch what you're doing because you don't want to overwater because it'll lead to uh, 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 rotting of your roots and uh, nutritional uh, deficiencies. Okay, what are you doing? About quarter till, good. Okay, this is from the earlier, um, this is pretty much ending my talk right now and I'll leave it open to questions. I showed you those pictures, these three uh, roses and, and um, that were from June and April. I pruned that same, uh, that's called New Dawn, the, the climbing rose on the left. I pruned that on Sunday and this is what it looked like after it was done. It's doesn't have any leaves. This is a once bloomer, uh, twice bloomer, I guess, by the way. So you can don't have to prune it in June. I pruned mine, like I said, this last Sunday. And that's the same rose pruned. And then the next one is called Henry Fonda. And that's what it looked like in April. And now, as of Sunday, this is what it looks like. So see how you, I removed the leaves. I took it way down, not too far down. And that's what the pruned roses look like. So I just want to remind you that um, these are the, um, you can go to our help desk to answer any questions. There's a lot of materials that were, um, and links on the Rose handout um, in terms of, there's a little bit of synopsis of what I talked about on the actual uh, Rose Winter Care and Pruning, but the handout has a lot of great links with demonstrations. I actually should have had my husband video me when I was pruning this last Sunday and I could have inserted those into here to show you firsthand, here's how you see a, you know, a, a outward bud um, and things like that. So take a look at those handouts because I think they'll be handy. And now I'm gonna just turn it over to um, Pam to let me know what kind of questions we have. Um, yeah, I think there's been a, there's two questions that have sort of um, come up from a couple of people. Yes, people would like you to talk a little bit about transplanting roses. Okay. And then the other one that comes up is sort of when do we start watering if there's no rain this spring? Should yeah. we be watering now and how much? Okay, well, let me address the watering one first then. Um, you know, I went out there the other day when I was on Sunday and I thought, you know, the area that I have that um, is sort of shaded and gets a lot of moisture, 
looked pretty good. I put my I put my index finger down into the soil and it was damp. Then I went to the back side of my house that is really hot and has reflective sun off of the side of the house, which I have ro uh, roses against there. And it was dry as a bone. And I haven't been running my irrigation and I thought I need to, and this is January. So go and check it out. I mean, I always, I have a general thumb where I stick a, a pencil in or I put my finger in and I see how damp it is. If it's really dry, you should water because it'll be fine for a while, but it won't be too much fun, too much better if, if we don't get any more rain. Um, so just monitor that. I if if it seems to be pretty damp, I wouldn't start irrigating too much until um, March. I would, you know, and then I would be very careful not to do too much watering in March. In the term, in the case of planting. Um, question to address that. Um, when you want to, there, there are two ways that roses come. They come bare root and they, and they on their own root and they come grafted. Um, the, it doesn't matter, bare root can be grafted and it can be on its own root. Pot roses are in pots like the ones I showed you. If you haven't planted very much roses, I would start with the kind that they have in pots. It's, it's just easier and you just, transplant, you know, the, the root is surrounded by soil and, and you put it in, in that way. So if you have something um, that you want to move or you're, or you have a new plant, you should prune it down to about five to six inches um, above the crown. So the crown is that union there, but keep it about five to six inches above that. Dig a hole that's, um, I'm looking at my notes because I always forget wide enough and deep enough to accommodate that whole root structure. So whether it's the bare root or the or the potted root, you want it, it bare root will be just roots that are like this. And they're usually in bag, bagged up. You want to sure it accommodates that entire root structure. So you gotta dig that hole wide and deep enough to, to have that go right in. On um if you have like sometimes you buy roses and they're in that um that cardboard peat mossy stuff instead of a, a heart uh, container, you want to peel that back. I always do. For our climate, I always position the graft knot or that union right at ground level. So I bring the soil right up to that ground level. And then I mend the soil, the bottom of the soil with um, some good compost. And I put in that, that hole that I dug, I put some, I amend the soil with like a mix, like I take an organic planting mix and I mix that in and then um, have it bring the soil level up to that graph knot. I hope that answered your question. Are there any others? Uh, yes, there are. And I think a couple of people raised their hands. So we were thinking we would let them answer or ask that question for themselves. So I'm just gonna go to the top of the list here. Um, and let's, uh, Charlotte, we'll, we'll go to you. Charlotte, go ahead and ask your question if you want to unmute yourself. Well, we'll, um, we'll go to the next person on the list, maybe. Um, how about, uh, Robin? Robin, would you like to ask your question? Okay, can you hear me now? We can. Oh, very good. I, I didn't see a button to push before. Um, <laughs> I have very, very old roses, um, like over 60 years old. And um, they have some of there's some really big canes uh, and some little ones that have been coming up, but I've been afraid to prune them. I sort of inherited the house, and um, but one of them has a black spot. I'm sure I'm up in Del Norte County, up in Klamath. Um, I'm just inland from the coast, mm -hmm. so I get a lot of rain, a lot of fog, that sort of thing. Um, but the one plant, which is my favorite rose of all. It's got these leaves that just sort of, they're just sort of curly. They just never seem like they're happy, you know? And that's the one that's really got, it looks to me like black spot. Is there any way to save this rose, do you mm -hmm. think? 
Yeah. Yeah. Do you take off all the leaves every year? No, I've never done this. This is the first time I've learned anything about anything. So that's my, that's what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. Yeah, would, a couple of things. I, yeah. I would look, first off, I'd look for any diseased or older canes that look like, you know, you'll know. I mean, you can almost take your hand and go like this and they'll break off. Um, and then you, I actually have some, I had some um, graft unions on some tree roses that were, you could see where that rose was grafted and then where they cut it off, where, where, where on the rootstock, where they cut it off, that, that was dead. So I just sawed that off. Just look around first to see, you know, what canes look really old. On, on an old rose like that, you might want to leave five to seven of the bigger canes or branches but go in and clean out the whole inside so it looks like a vase and then remove all those leaves because those diseases like uh, rose spot, those fungal diseases, they'll carry over. So you wanna get rid of those leaves and see what happens, especially if they're curling, you might wanna think about there's other, um, you can probably do um, curling leaves on roses, UCCA and, and into a search engine on Google or something. And it'll come up and tell you what might be causing that. I can't think of what it is right now. It could be, um, could be even a beetle of some kind, but I, I think it's too late for that in the year for, uh, for a beetle, but I would definitely take off all those leaves and trim out all those older dead canes. I have roses in my yard that are probably 50 years old too, mm -hmm. that I inherited when I moved into this house. And I know a lot of people do, or you have, like, I think Pamela was telling me she was watering in her yard the other day, and all of a sudden she's got these new irrigation system, and she has roses popping up she didn't even know she had that were coming up from, you know, because they hadn't been, they were on either, um, they're either on old rootstock or they're coming up from a rose that was there at one time. Um, so I would definitely do that. I would take all the leaves off for sure. And get it to that base shape that's open and, and, and allows air circulation to keep away the past and whatnot. And I, I, so I shouldn't be afraid to take off some of the height. I mean, it's like well taller than I am. Absolutely I mean. not. Bring, bring it down. Oh yeah, bring it down a third. Okay. Okay. If you look at the whole, say, okay, okay I'm gonna take a third of this off and you can go, have to do anything fancy at the first you can just take down some of the growth so you can start to work so you can get in there and do the stuff and then start looking for that outward facing um, buds and take those so that your plant will start to grow out instead of sending shoots in when you cut from the inside at that cane like this versus on the outside like that um, it forces the branch or the cane to grow like this if you cut on the outside it'll shoot it out this way and create that open area that you want the air circulation base shape. Now, are, are the buds very obvious? Because where I obvious. have seen, and that's where I have, where I've seen new canes come out in places, it's like, well, there was nothing there before. It's almost like it came out from under the skin of the cane. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, it does. So go look, when you look at that, you'll see it's like a, a line and you know that the, that bud is gonna swell there and shoot out a, a branch which is a cane. So that's, right. that's that bud union I'm looking, I'm telling you to look for and cut it at that 45 degree angle, a fourth of an inch above that, whichever one you want for the height, because they're, they're all along the way there. You'll see them. Okay. So that it, they aren't, they don't necessarily look like a bud, like you expect a bud to look. It's like a, um, gosh, I wish I had a picture of it. So it's just sort it of was like in a the presentation. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. kind of like, um, it's outward facing, um, like little knot kind of, but it's small and it can even be a, just a line. Right. It doesn't you'll have to be a, a big you, thing. When you start examining that cane, you'll start to see them all the way around. You'll, you'll notice them. Okay. Thank you very much. That, that was very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more, Pamela, or raise your hand? Uh, yeah, there are a couple more. And maybe this would be relevant because I think there have been some questions about sort of, you know, inheriting roses and, and you know, trying to make sense of what you've got. Um, there are some common rootstocks out there. Um, and um, I'm maybe you'd like to talk about what, when, when you see something bloom, but it's not very attractive. <laughs> well, okay. It could be your rootstock. <laughs> yeah, you have to. Well, sometimes you have um, suckers that are from an old plant that your roses 
three feet away and all of a sudden you've got a rose here that you don't think you ever planted it could be a sucker coming off off of that and and i have i took a bunch out this week uh because i thought you know what that's a sucker that i haven't caught in 26 years or something and i have this rose i thought hey i have a little rose growing here well it didn't put out any flowers it had the ugliest pencil um with pencil sized um canes branches and I thought, this is not doing me any good. It's right where I would rather have something else. I just dug it out. So Agreed. you have to kind of make a decision about what you want to keep because you may not want, roses take water and you may want to put in a different kind of plant. So you have to kind of say, do I really want to care about and prune this every year? Is it something that I didn't know I had and I just got and it doesn't look that attractive? You may not want to keep it. For sure. I know that I have had some of mine um, bloom and um so i was like oh look there's a rose but really the rose that came out was like when it bloomed it had very few petals it, it looked more like a wild rose right so it was dark red and it had a lovely scent but the petals fell off in like two days i mean you know and i took that actually to other master gardeners and said what's that and they were like that's your rootstock get rid of that that's not ever gonna you know make a prettier rose so i dug those out um and some other people who are listening might also yeah, find I have the same boat water. when you start watering. <laughs> um, there are a couple other questions, so maybe we'll take um, another um, another attendee. Let's see, Charlotte. Uh, she's still here, so let's see if we can give her a chance. Charlotte, I'm gonna invite you to unmute yourself. Can we do that, Ms. Hosey? Yeah, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll go to Sue. Sue Glenn, you are welcome to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi. Hi, I live in Napa. Um, and for the last few years, I haven't been able to go out and prune my roses because I've had uh, some trouble with shoulders. So um, I know I've got the, ro the roses are planted, but there's um, large, well, there's some um, probably one inch. Um, we put rock around the bottom of the rose bushes. And I know that there's some leaves in there that are um, have rust on them. Do all of those have to be pulled out individually or is there a way I can treat that in that rock? Um you know what rust if you have rust leaves in the rocks you're going to have rust on the on the rose again next year if you don't get rid of those leaves so i'm going to have to go out and and hand pick all of that out then yeah or see if someone can either blow it out or you can keep the rocks about keep the rocks away from the 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 stem of the a rose anyway i don't know but i have mulch and i and i have a I had rust too, and I thought, okay, well, how am I going to get rid of this? Because I'm going to have, when I pruned them all, that all came down. So I basically try to blow it off with a, with a, I have electric blower and try to blow it off that way and see if I could get those rust leaves away. Rust tends to, if you have it and you don't get rid of it and it's on the ground or any, and you leave it on a rose, but you don't take the leaf off, you're going to get rust again. Okay. Well, back in the summer, I noticed that I had some black spot too. So I was picking, I was, I was going out and stripping the, the uh, leaves off, trying to leave the healthy ones and just stripping off the, the diseased ones. And, um, and the, I have a Mr. Lincoln rose that is got a really bad shape now. So um, I, I'm going to try to, to see if I can open it up. Um, the main, one of the main canes looks like it's dead. So I'm going to have to saw that one off, but, and then I have another rose that puts on suckers all the time and it's just a real problem. And that's a uh, Barbara Bush and it's, it's a beautiful rose, but it's got terrible thorns on it. So I'm, I'm almost to the point, I think I need to dig it up and just get rid of it. Yeah, sometimes it, it's a hard decision to make because, but in the end, you know, you probably would want a more desirable plant there. I would actually ask for where you have the black um, spot rose. Do you have, um, is there a good air circulation around it? And are you seeing that, um, 
it's uh, wet all the time. I'm just wondering. Well, yeah, my husband has a tendency to to turn. We water them from the the bottom. You know, we just turn on the mm -hmm. hose and let it run. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it runs too long, and he thinks he's deep watering. But I think it's causing more problem than help. Yeah. So um, I I'm sure you know we do have clay too and yeah, um that's probably contributing one of the things you want to do too with the black spot is um um you can use neem oil on it and it's fairly helpful um that's you know use that as a last measure but you know they'll they'll be effective uh to reduce your black spot um i would be very uh leery of using any time release sort of in the soil types of fungicides or anything like that because they they just they don't they're not good for the environment but neem oil or something would be effective on on your uh on your black spot if you if you try to uh, open it up get good air circulation around it and not you know get keep it so moist it it, it may go away uh, with just those measures but if it doesn't that's i would say you might have to a result to spraying it with neem oil so in, if they're planted like two and a half foot apart from each other, is that too close together? No, as long as you keep air, you can keep air circulation by uh, cleaning, uh, pruning out the interior of the, of the plant too. So it has that open vase shape. Okay. Um, they're growing into each other and they're, and it's always moist uh, between, you know, the two roses there, then they're both, they, do they both have black spot? They might. Yeah. Um, the, the barber bush and the Mr. Lincoln, and I really like Mr. Lincoln because it has such a nice fragrance. Yeah, um, uh, those like are both good sized roses, so um, you, that might that proximity might be contributing to part of the problem too. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I I'm going to see if I can pull up the um, the handouts that you had. Okay, so. good. Yeah, they have some of that in there. Especially okay. The IPM one that's at the very bottom on the resource page is a great one to go to and it, it'll give you descriptions about all the diseases and the funguses and the insects that affect roses. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And it was very informative. I appreciate your help. Thanks. Another thing to note on those packages of horticultural oil and neem oil they do have a warning yes. not to use them over certain temperatures. And so right. that's the other advantage of early uh, uh, attention to your roses because when it reaches 85 degrees and full sun, there isn't a whole lot you can do for the things you see on the rose at that point. That's true, very true. <laughs> Well, All right. Uh, let's see. Um, I th um, Roberta, maybe I can only see part of the name. Um, let's uh, it, go ahead and ask your question. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm not sure if they're still there. And Charlotte's invitation is still extended. She hasn't responded. So, um, oh, there's another question. Um, that maybe you want want to answer in the. Um, what about roses in pots, and can they coexist with any other plants in pots? Yes, they can, and I've had them uh, with other plants. Depends on the watering needs of the other plant, and depends on the size of the container, and if you're crowding one of them out or the other. Um, you know, so if they have similar watering needs, it's probably fine. Um, sometimes people do tree roses, and I always do. I have a tree rose, and then I might have some kind of draping, kind of flowering um, uh, uh, plant at the bottom of it, just because it they spill over the side of the container and it looks pretty. Um, they have similar um, watering conditions. Um, if I um, um, it works. You just have to make sure that you don't water your rose too much or water the other plant too much or not enough. Um, and that you're not suffocating one or the other because they're, they have big root systems and one's taking over um, for the other. 
so yeah, it works out fine. And sometimes it's very desirable and pretty to have them both uh, like that in a container. And with container planting, you always have to be careful that you don't dry it out because containers tend to dry out very quickly. The soil does. Indeed. All right. So another question. <laughs> uh, this one feels familiar. Um, what options do you have for removing Bermuda grass? <laughs> is essentially using the rose and climbing up it. I know this is a tough one. My neighbor has Bermuda grass and I feel like I'm always trying to kick it. And I know winter is really the time to um, you know, but they, I don't know if the Bermuda grass killer has any effect on roses. It is absolutely a no, no near salvia. Oh boy. There's a whole, we could go into a lot of discussion about Bermuda grass. That stuff is hard to kill and hard to get rid of. And even if you have clippings that you use as mulch around a rose and it's from a Bermuda grass, so you cut your Bermuda grass and you say, okay, you know, these are clippings that are kind of dried out, doesn't matter. I'm gonna put them around the base of my um, rose to, to be like, you know, to protect the, keep the moisture in the roots. And, and guess what? You're gonna have Bermuda grass growing all over the place around that rose because it doesn't die. Um, so I guess if your question is, how do you get rid of Bermuda grass? Um, I would Google, um, because it, it's there's a whole huge process to do it and mostly it's scraping it out and getting it dug out um because i don't think solarization or sheet mulching will do the job no i think if there was one thing i could add to that it would really be if you have bermuda grass someplace you think you'd like to have roses deal with the bermuda grass first that could be a two-year process, but deal with it first because your options are very limited once you have some other plant there. Very limited. Oh, um, Japanese beetles. You want to talk about what we really have since that we is- don't, We don't we look have- look at out-of-state resources. They're always talking about Japanese beetles on roses and that's very confusing. We don't have Japanese beetles. And if you see one, you need to call the uh, your county health, your county agricultural department, and, and report them because the, in we might have hooplia beetles, H O P L I A beetles. They're often mistaken as Japanese beetles. Yes. Um, but we don't have um, we don't have a serious pest problem with Japanese beetles in the United States. Um, the difference between Japanese beetles are um about twice as long uh, and and metallic and with coppery wings um they're not established in california at all so there are no japanese beetles in california at all and i'm looking at something that i printed today because i was concerned yep. about beetles so there are a couple of beetles that you'll see on roses and i think the one that's commonly mistaken is h-o-p-l-i-a i think it's hoplia beetle mm -hmm. um it's about um a quarter inch long it chews holes in the petals of the flowers um, and it likes light colored flowers best, um, like pink, apricot, yellows. Um, it doesn't ever damage leaves. It just goes right to the, to the chewing on the um, flowers and their larvae, when they reproduce, they, um, there are root feeders. Um, um, so you have to be careful. So there's usually, um, there's a whole thing on these beetles, but it's not a Japanese beetle. I think sometimes there's confusion too about um, fig eater beetles, which aren't doing any damage to roses, but look similar and people, because they're also green and metallic in the, in the late summer, people can confuse them. And sometimes the confusion is seeing leaf cutter bee damage on the leaves at the same time as the fig eater beetles are out and about for other reasons. So um examine before you uh, uh, try some pest control at the end of the year, because most of the time the roses don't need it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we, you know, the two last people that had their hands up, um, I, I don't, um, don't, uh, haven't come back, you know, they were invited to ask their question and haven't come back. So um, I do not know. Um, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Christopher. Um, 
Hang on, I'm going to go. You already typed your question, so I'm going to go back and find it. Oh, there's one that's from Jody, too. So she's recommending what do you what do you do about hooplia beetles? Yeah, uh, you can you know what? Um, hand pick them off. Insecticidal sprays aren't effective, and they're not necessarily in a garden situation. So I would just pick them off. There we go. Um, Loretta has asked me a couple questions, but this one I I don't know the answer to. Um, she had baby rose bushes that said that the package said they were ground cover um, and they've actually grown about four feet high and sort of into each other. Um, she planted them about four feet apart and um, what kind of rose is that really and how should be, she be trimming or pruning them? So if that sounds, okay, that could be any kind of rose. So um, it sounds like a landscape rose uh, or a shrub. Not a carpet rose, is that what they call those? I can't hear you. A carpet rose? Um, I don't know about carpet roses, but they sometimes they label them carpet roses. Those are those are usually landscape roses, okay, um, or hedge roses. Um, and if they're growing into each other, depends on how close you planted them to each other. If you want them to be almost like a like the, one of the typical ones is simplicity, and, um, and they grow. People like to have them because they're always ever blooming and they create kind of a hedge look. Um, so it all depends on what kind of look and landscape feature you want in your yard and how how close you planted them to each other. Um, if the, a lot of the branches look dead, I would prune them out. Um, and if if you want space in between those roses and they're it, it, instead of having them look like a hedge, prune them so that they have that shape. I guess is that answering the question? I think so. I think so. Um... Christopher's question, um, his rose plants really grew well this season, but with very few blooms. Why would that be? Um, did he, I'd have to ask, did he prune it? Did he have a regular, um, you know, um, annual um, maintenance on them in terms of, of you know, fertilizing? Um, oh, I should say one of my favorite fertilizers of all is alfalfa pellets. They're inexpensive. You can go to your feed store and get them. You can, I put about a cup on each side of my roses and they are timed release and they are so wonderful. So if you have, it all depends on if they had enough water, if they were pruned, if they got um, some feeding, how the soil is. Um, did something change in your yard from one season, one year to the next? It's hard to answer without knowing all those things. Yeah, and I don't know. I know that when I have done the really old rose that, that I have, that's the most established, I've gotten a lot of cane growth, but not necessarily a lot of flowers um, on the years that I totally neglected to fertilize them at all. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't know if, um, you know, you mentioned balanced fertilizer, but if the fertilizer was perhaps unbalanced and had too much nitrogen relative, would that cause more vegetative growth the way it does for some other plants? It could. And you can get nitrogen heavy too, which would cause a lot of growth and not a lot of blooms. Okay, there we go. I mean, we can't know for sure, but that's probably what we'd investigate. Groovy. All right. Can you repeat the name of the fertilizer you like? I think that's what Jyoti is oh, asking for. Oh, you know, alfalfa pellets. There are, that's what that they feed, um, you know, rabbits, like, you know, little, uh, and home, you know, gerbils and things like that. So I, you can go to a feed store. There's a couple of them. And there's one in Cupertino. There's several, um, Anjan, I think it is, or Anjan. I'm not recommending just them, but I'm just saying alfalfa pellets are wonderful. Um, and you can get them in 50 pound bags for hardly anything. And they're just little pellets that even look like Osmocote or like time released and, and just, you know, take, I put a cup on either side, dig them into the soil around my rows and they love them. So it's a real inexpensive way to um, fertilize and healthier for the environment. Hmm. Um, somebody's noticing that neighbors' trees are now shading roses. That is complicated because 
too much shade can like like too much wind or neighbors who are also not taking care of their roses can mean you have rust even if you're doing everything right uh, <laughs> any tips for shade covering the roses shade roses love sun so move the rose if you can this would be a good time um, because it, this is a good time to, they're in their dormancy stage. Um, but, you know, aside from asking your neighbor to, to prune his tree so he's not shading your yard is, I'd, Rose won't do well if it's in shade. Agreed. Um, uh, Liz, do you have, here, I'll, I'll let you, uh, oops. Yes, I'm Liz. Okay, got you. <laughs> Go ahead and ask. Did you have another question? Well, you kind of touched on rose carpet, which is a, a small, like a miniature rose. Do you prune mm -hmm. that this way? And then I did want to know about pruning iceberg roses, which don't seem to have such sturdy canes. They're kind of willowy. Mm -hmm. you prune them the same way? Um. I'm thinking that when you say uh, miniature rose, um, are you talking about, because they do, a miniature rose can be six inches to three feet tall. Um, uh, but most of them are about the 12 to 18 inch uh, tall yeah, range. Same size. Uh -huh. okay. So they're less prickly. Um, they, right. and, and, um, and they, they're, you don't have to prune them as much as you would a hybrid tea. They're ever blooming. Um, so I, Yes, you can prune them the same way, but they're not, you don't need to be as, as picky about pruning them. And you probably should follow the same rules about looking for any disease canes, looking for really skinny, the skinniest ones and getting them off, um, things like okay. that. Okay. And so then Roseburg, I mean, Iceberg, I just do like a Floribunda. Yeah, or, uh, you know, um, I think the icebergs are the ones that the, are the newer ones that are more ever blooming and they have fewer thorns. Um, so, you know, you deadhead them when, when they bloom um, and then do it the same way um, as you would the other ones. Okay, thank you. Great. You, you really can't go wrong when you prune roses. You can be, you can, unless you do such heavy pruning that you cause an older rose to die. It's kind of an art that after a while you start to go, okay, that rose likes it this way, this one doesn't, this one likes a heavy pruning. You kind of get the, the, your groove. You can't really mess them up too much unless they're, uh, they're diseased and dying anyway or really old and you do too much. Good, all right. Good. Joseph, we'll give you a chance to ask your question. You have something about yellowing leaves or something? I thought maybe I can remember. Okay, oh. can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. go ahead. You can? Yep. Sorry. <laughs> it's a two-step process. Just yeah. catching on, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so my question was about fertilizing, which you already answered with the pellets. That's a great. I actually used a steer manure, so I hope that wasn't an awful thing to do. Um, because I had to redo my soil. I've had roses for about 20 years and I've never done anything to the soil, but I decided to just put in some new dirt and mix it with for, uh, steer manure and put it in. And then I, I put compost on top, which I think around the roots, I might've cut them back too far this year now that I've heard how you say don't cut them. But my, my other question now is when you go to the store and you look at roses to buy them because there's so many to do, what do you look for when you look at them in the pot? And, and like, how do you determine that this one is a good one and that one's not so good to pick? And you can tell right then and there, other than just seeing black spots and things like that. But, but what else are you looking for? Okay, so there's two times that you can buy two. Right now, if you buy a rose, it's gonna be like, like those photos I showed you. It's gonna be pruned to um, whether it's, it's, um, it's, it's in a container or whether it's um, got the roots that are exposed, but they're just wrapped up. Um, so if I'm looking right now and whether to plant a rose is the best time because I can look at that rose and, and see that well, number one, I'm gonna buy a cultivar that has, uh, it's resistant. So I want it 
they have them that are resistant to mites, they have them resistant to powdery mildew, by one that's been cultivated for disease and insect um, resistance. I also want to buy one for the area that I want to put it in. So do I want it to climb? Do I want it to be a hedge? Do I want it to be like a, a standing rose that is a specimen rose by itself that's like a grand flora or a florabenda or a hybrid tea? Hybrid trees, remember, they're the kind that florists use that grow um, a rose at the end. Or do I want it to be ever blooming? Do I want it to bloom once a year? So I have to kind of look at, you know, what, what do I really want? Do I want color throughout the year or just one time in June? Because um, that pink rose I showed you on the front of mine is a one, is a one or two time bloomer. And in, in June, it's beautiful, but the rest of the year, it's just, you know, I'm just dealing with it, trying to keep the leaves looking green. Um, and then you have to, um, you know, pick a sunny uh, spot and, and put it in, but it's really what color do you want? What size do you want? What shape do you want? Um, do you want it, you know, color all year, that kind of thing. And then buy one that looks really healthy. If you buy one in the summertime that's leafed out and it's got roses on it and you see powdery mildew, don't buy it for one that doesn't have any disease on it because you'll have, you'll be dealing with that probably for a, it probably has, it's not a cultivar that's resistant to that, or it's just been poorly cared for. It's going to take a, a year or two to get, you know, back in shape. So that's what I look for. And I look for, you know, um, good growers that I know of that I, that produce good plants. And I've even bought roses online and had them shipped to me. Hey, that sounds oh, that cool. answered Thank your you question. For all the info. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Welcome. I'm going to take a question from the chat um, about new dawn climbing roses. So it's had sort of slow growth, um, but haven't bloomed in four in more than four years. And then Glenda, uh, we'll come to your question after after uh, Pam's had a chance with that. So I have new dawn, and that's the picture that I showed you um, on my cover, the pink roses that were the part of the presentation when you signed up. I don't know if you saw that. Those are new dawn. And I've had that rose for probably about, I don't know, 20 years, 18 years, something like that. It's, it, for me, it's, it says it's a, a twice, it's a repeat bloomer, but I don't see it repeat blooming. I see it put out roses, you know, probably in June and then maybe I'll get a couple more, but not very many. Are you pruning that rose? I would ask, are you feeding that rose? Um, those are the things that I would look for. I would look, if you look, I would look in the, on the soil and see, do, is there a gopher maybe? I mean, I've had them really attack some roses in my yard. Um, and that would cause it to just be putting all its energy into the roots instead of into growth and, and blooms. So you have to kind of do a little detective work and go out there and see what's going on. Um, if, if you haven't pruned it, you know, you should. And um, again, I showed you a photo of that one that's on the trellis, that, that's new dawn and that's pruned it to death. You saw that, right? It doesn't have any leaf on it um, type of thing. I hope that answered it. I think so. All right, we'll go to Glenda. Glenda, um, let's see, can you unmute yourself? And asks your question. Glenda, are you there? Okay, gonna jump over to Jody. Jody, are you there? You can ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I have um, had a rose doing well, but I wanted to replace it because I didn't didn't like that particular rose, and plant a different variety in the same spot. And the new rose that I planted there just up and died. And so as I had heard about like roses don't like to be planted in the same spot where there had been another rose. Have you heard anything about this? I haven't experienced that um, or heard about it. Um, okay. But I'd have to investigate it to see if there's any scientific information or research-based information about that. I haven't heard that. 
Um, did, was it a nice cultivar that looked healthy at the beginning? Yeah, yeah, um, Hotel California. Huh. And it, um, wow. yeah, got it from, from Reagan Nursery. So I did you do, yeah, that's, I love Reagan's roses. Mm -hmm. did, did you look, did the soil look like there had been like any, when you, did you pull it out? Did you look at the roots or is it still there? Have you looked at it? Oh, it's not there anymore. It's something that happened a little while ago. And I thought since I had an expert here, I would see if I could pick your brain a bit. I haven't ever heard about planting a rose in a, other, uh, in a spot where another rose was. If, if the rose that was there beforehand was, was thriving and healthy, mm -hmm. then I would assume that another rose planted there would be the same. Uh, but I'd have to research if that, if that's, if there's some, some information that says that don't plant a rose where another rose was. I can't imagine that would be the case. I've, I've done it and I haven't had a problem. Okay. Um, I can only think that maybe something got to it or when you removed it, you could have seen damage to the roots or, you know, cause I, again, I said that I've had go gopher damage and, and they haven't killed them yet, but they sure have made them weaken for a while. Mm -hmm. um, something got to that and I can't imagine what it was. It could have been overwatered. It could have had, but if you have other plants that were doing well in the area, I can't yeah. imagine what got to that. So right in with all my other roses. Yeah. Yeah. That's too bad. All right. Well, I'll just have to. Well, if you don't have that. anything there, you could potentially, you know, excavate a little in the area where it was and just make sure you don't have anything lingering. But, mm -hmm. you know, and then maybe give it a try again. Maybe this year is the year. <laughs> maybe. All right. Thank you. Um, another question, um, sort of, um, I, this is going to be hard to generalize, but um, is there any sort of um, estimate for how much water, um, to, you know, uh, how much water an individual rose needs, maybe, you know, the, you know, floribunda or, you know, something sort of larger standard relative to the size of the plant? since watering methods obviously are different application rates? Yeah, there's general rule of thumb about watering. Um, and I'm going back to my notes to see what I had written down. Um, twice weekly is usually all you need for roses and landscapes is what I had written down. And I don't know how that equates to gallons, but I know that um, you want to have the water depleted um, in between waterings. So in other words, if you have, if you're watering and you, and the next time that that drip or timer goes off or you uh, are going to put water on there, if you notice it's damp, then you don't water. Um, Cause like I said, even in um, desert areas in California, daily irrigation, even in the hottest part of California, they don't, they only ir irrigate every eight days. And there's a, there's some, um, something I read about um, it can how it should deplete about two inches worth of water per whatever so I'd have to look that up again I just kind of look at how my roses look and that and I set my uh, I have drips so uh, I have a drip system so I know how much gallon it goes out per hour and then I just kind of do it that way I, I actually have I think gallon drippers and I only drip, uh, water 15 minutes yeah, I have that bit that big rose that's in my front yard that's probably been here since the house was built in 76 or something like that. Um, uh, the drip is broken. And so I go out there and hand water. And so I will move the mulch and take a look at what it's like under there. But I would say that unless we're having 110 degree type days, it's almost once every two weeks. And, you know, that's all I do hand water with the hose until everything looks damp yeah. and I keep checking and it's usually you know about it, one and a half weeks when it starts to look dry so I let it you know be dry before I water again yeah I think I water in the heat of the summer the hottest days I might water twice a week otherwise I'd probably water once a week um and I just monitor you have to just kind of look and see and and see how it goes I think you can also Google that too. Um, if you did um, rose watering, and then always put a UC like University of California CA, you'll get the you'll get the, the really good information from 
from you know rose experts that are out there doing you know agricultural rose growing for you know nurseries and things like that so the, the, there's a guy named John Carrick that um, a lot of my information comes from when I'm when I'm doing talks and he's a rose expert and I think you can get right to his information pretty easily maybe he has a general rule of thumb for watering I didn't find it when I was looking but because I wanted to make sure I did everything that was you know really scientifically based but sometimes it's just you getting out there and seeing what's going on in your garden and and how they're doing with the watering schedule you have for sure um let's see i think the only people with um questions at the moment um have not uh we we sent out a request allowing them to talk and they haven't responded so um, you might be. So I know that, um, Daniel, did you want to, um, did you have a particular yeah, you time that we you? Sorry, what was that? I was just wondering if you had a particular time you wanted us to wrap up here. Um, I think we, we can just about wrap up. It looks like maybe one more person, uh, just raised their hands. Okay. Um, maybe Glenda, if we want to take that question. Yeah, I, I sent her a request in that she could unmute and okay. she hasn't responded. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. It's not showing. I don't think um, she's attached to sound, it looks like, because oh. the mute button's not popping up. Got it. Um, yeah. So if there's any other questions. Okay. Cool. Really? Um, oh, I see. Yeah, what is your question, Agnes? We can also invite you to talk. Let me. Can you there hear you us? Go. There we yes. go. <laughs> I didn't see an option to talk earlier. I'm like, oh, don't go away yet. So we have a, a yellow, but yellow rose bush in the front yard, and uh, it was happy for many years. But then in the last few years, it's starting to sprout this mystery, smaller, dark pink cluster of roses. And year over year, the little darker <laughs> roses have kind of gotten more prolific, and we get fewer and fewer yellow, but yellow roses. I was just wondering if there's a way to reverse it back or promote the bloom of the big yellow ones that we originally got. <laughs> so that tells me that the, the that was a grafted plant probably onto a rootstock that was um, probably had uh, red, blue, was a flower that was red, that had a rose that was red. And so somehow or another that rootstock uh, is take either got pruned, too much of the graft union got pruned out and the rootstock is taking over. So um, unless there was another old rose that was there that's that's coming up, but I, I can't imagine that um, that would be the case so much. So I'm kind of thinking that the graft union um, was cut where they were the the yellow rose was grafted onto the rootstock of that rose that has a, a red red bloom. So you probably can't reduce you can't reverse it. Oh darn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah. To overly aggressive pruning, I guess. <laughs> the only thing I Yeah, unless there was another rose that it's coming up next to it, but I doubt it because if no, it's the it's same, the it same like it's the same thing and it's probably yeah. the graft union. Yeah. Yeah, it's the graft, the graft union is failing or got cut. And the nice. other one's taking over. <laughs> It's all good. All right, um, Robin, um, are you there? You you can be the final question. <laughs> Robin, you're allowed to talk. Um, it's not showing us a microphone. You might have to connect to audio if there's a button to do that. Otherwise, you can uh, definitely try and type it in the chat if you want to do that. Yeah. 
have to be slow a little bit. I do it slow. Oh, Glenn, Glenda's talking. Oh, <laughs> are you there? Uh, Glenda, we can hear you. You can unmute yourself and ask a question if you like. <laughs> she may not want to. Um, it's quite all right. <laughs> so Robin, did, if, oh, yeah. I'm there. I'm oh, here. Great. great. Yay. <laughs> I got in late to the presentation and then I got off in another room. But anyway, I have um, a Neil Diamond Rose. I don't know if you know it or not. But it grows tremendously fast. And I haven't uh, cut it back for at least two years because I've been unable to do so. And it's like about 10 feet tall. It just grows like a rat. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't have a lot of base uh, branches. <clears throat> and the ones that it does have are all looking very aged. It puts more energy into so, the growth than it does, especially since I haven't pruned it. I'm wondering yeah. if, if I it's should that tall, it really you can, yeah. hard or what? Take it I down a half. Do. Take it down a half. Okay. Try it because if it's that tall and you're not getting any and it's getting spindly and you're not getting, are you getting many blooms? Yeah, it blooms like crazy and it smells yeah. wonderful. You can, you can, there's, there's a fellow that, that I follow that's a great rose grower and he uh, grows Sally Holmes and that thing is 10 feet tall and he gets out his hedge trimmers and oh. the whole top of it off and then kind of trims it up and cleans it up. Um, and it grows like that every year and he takes off, you know, a half okay um, yeah and I'll so I, yeah and neil diamond things is pretty hardy but um yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, unless you take it so far down like you know if you take two-thirds of it down you might have a problem but i would take it like a try a half i mean okay what happens and and now if no new shoots come from the base that's what worries me if there's just all old canes, will they regenerate? Old canes are fine um, the, because you haven't pruned it in a couple years, Glenda. It's yeah. probably, it's probably, Good. that's why it's, it's, you're not seeing any new, um, they're called basal um, branches or basils, uh, B-A-S-E-L. That's why you're not seeing those come up um, probably. So you probably want to, um, get it pruned definitely and and okay yeah yeah i was when you said that i thought i had looked at it just a day or so ago and it it's looking pretty pathetic but it just it blooms so easily mm -hmm. that i didn't want to lose it i don't think you will if it's that tall okay yeah i will chop it down a bit then yeah just be careful not to get it you know two-thirds down or where you see yeah yeah, no, I won't do that. And just play it by ear over ear. You might want to take it just a little bit, you know, keep it two years. That's probably why you're seeing what you're seeing. Okay. I will try that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. I only got half of you, but it was what I got was very interesting. Thank you. Half of the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robin, are you able to talk? I think so. Can you hear me? There you are. Yes. I moved over to my phone. Yes. There's a little microphone on my phone, but not on the other device I was using. It's weird. There we go. Anyway, um, okay. So this is an old rose that my mother planted. And when it was planted, it was in a perfect spot. And just like the other gentleman was saying, a tree is now grown and it's shadowed most of the time. Um, what are the odds of me being able to transplant that thing? Is there anything I really need to pay attention to as far as how much root ball and that sort of thing? What's I my... would, yeah, if it's old root, if it's that old, 
um, you probably want to get, this is a perfect time. Just dig pretty deep and, um, you know, try to get, you'll see where the graft union is at, at the bud union at the, at the base. Then you can start to, you'll start to see the roots go down and get those big ones. You know, you're going to want to get those main big ones. Um, if you think about a bare root rose, the shape of that, you might want to look online and say, you know, what is a bare root rose? I Good think uh, look like, what are the roots on that look like before that when they're first planted? You're gonna wanna get a lot of that since it's an older rose. Um, and, you know, dig, keep digging and, you know, and, and if it takes a few days to just get down and fine tune to where those finer roots are, then you could probably just, if it were me, I would just get as much as I could and then clip those off and then get it into a, a nice um, big enough hole like I said, you want to get all that root mass in there and you want to supplement that soil probably with some organic um, compost or good organic uh, potting soil um, and try it. I mean, it's going it, to, the shade's eventually not, it's going to not, it's going to get all kinds of problems with the shade. Right, right. So it's almost like, you know, what do I have to lose? I'm either going to have this rose that's going to slowly you know, dwindle away and look terrible or give it a chance somewhere else. But you're saying a couple days digging that hole is okay. What I just would cover it with like burlap or something or yeah, what? Yeah, would... yeah, you could, sure. It, Cause they're dormant right now. Right. And you're so... and, you, and the bare root roses are the way they're shipping them to the nurseries. So. Okay. So I don't yeah. have to try to make sure that it all happens in an afternoon. No, and I would just, you know, keep it kind of, like you said, if you have burlap or something, you can cover it or, you know, or lay something over it, you know, the hole that you're digging. It should be yeah. fine. Uh, um, it, it, you know, you can always put a little bit of water to help loosen up the soil, the, um, the roots anyway, so you can get... We just had, we just had five inches of rain. <laughs> well, you're probably, you're probably good then. It might start to come out itself. Shelly, yeah. we haven't even had an inch this year. Oh this my God. whole year. We had five inches in three days. Yeah, that was not fun. Are you in Napa? No, I'm up north from there. I'm up in oh. Delmer County. Oh, okay, got Miami. it. Yep. Miami. Yeah. Look at you guys. Yeah, I guess so. Well, thank you so much. So I shouldn't be afraid to try this. I should just, it is dormant. Just tell myself it's dormant, even though there's green leaves on it. Yeah, and get those, you're gonna have to yeah. prune it down. Yeah. Once you get it out of that, once you move it, prune it down, you know, get it down um, so that it puts energy into those roots instead of into the canes. Right, right. So would you prune it first before that, before well, you drag it I would, out? I'd get it out of the hole, I'd get it in the hole, and then I'd prune it. Oh, okay. I was just wondering I'd, if it was easier it to move, handle if I pruned move, it. Then I'd prune it, yeah, once it was in the ground, in the new location. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Groovy. All right, well, I think we got it. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and if there's any questions about roses or any other topic that you need Master Gardener help with, um, feel free to contact us via the help desk. We're always there to help you.